Hi, everyone. All right, let's do this. Hair, something we all in this room have, and perhaps some of us more than others. Hair can be iconic. Hair can start a revolution. Hair has been associated with identity, self-expression, and freedom for hundreds of years. It is extraordinary what these fibers can represent. It is also extraordinary what these fibers in and of themselves are capable of. And to make that point, imagine treating the fibers of your clothing the same way you treat your hair every day. This means wearing it every day, never taking it off, shampooing, drying, heat styling, brushing, coloring. Most clothing fibers would start to disintegrate within a matter of weeks, if not days, and yet our hair is able to withstand a lot. And perhaps this is because nature has had millennia to perfect the concept of a fiber. And in the case of hair, its design medium of choice is protein, a powerhouse unit of biology. And man, when biology designs things, it is sophisticated and sustainable, and it makes me wonder, can we access that? And let me tell you why I'm so fascinated by this concept of biological design. For hair, think of how we treat it today. When I was getting ready for this event, I needed to style my hair. I'm using chemicals, sometimes harsh chemicals, sometimes not great for us or the environment, and I'm using damaging heat, which is energy intensive. Nature, on the other hand, designs elegant bonds between proteins to form an endless array of shapes and sometimes colors that last forever. And it is de facto sustainable. It literally regrows itself. It is biodegradable. This is how powerful biology as a tool is. And humans, of course, when we see something that we want to emulate, we take it, we extract it. Today, these proteins are commercially available and they are sourced from animals. But the most interesting thing is the fact that we never were able to emulate the things that inspired us originally. The beauty industry is trying to move away from animal-based sourcing and find plant-based alternatives. And that makes us feel better. We imagine a garden being treated with love and care. This is my grandma in a small village in former Yugoslavia treating her garden with love and care. She's in her late 80s, and to this day, she plants and harvests everything there. In the summer, her garden would be blooming with roses. Rose is the most popular fragrance on the planet. It is estimated we need 200,000 petals to create just a few milliliters of rose oil. This is the reality of plant-based sourcing. And the truth is that this earth could not grow enough plants to sustain this industry. It leads to the logical question of whether or not this extractive relationship that we have with nature is really the tool that we want to carry us into the future. I think about things from the perspective of tools because I'm an engineer. In fact, I went to school here at MIT where I studied chemical and biological engineering. And this mashup of chemistry and biology would influence me throughout my career. And to give you a little peek of how I see things. If we think about hair again, the entire underlying science of hair care is surface chemistry. Effectively, how do we coat our hair fibers to make them feel a certain way or do the things that we want, but we leave the biology, the actual proteins within the fiber alone. We saw how sophisticated biology is able to pull off the same things we want. From that perspective, it's actually quite interesting. We are biological creatures, and yet we are using chemistry as our singular tool, and ironically, chemistry to control the things that come to us naturally. Could we start to do the same things biology does to create sophisticated and sustainable tools? The reality was that we actually didn't understand how biology did many of the amazing things that it did. But just a few short blocks from here, around the same time I was arriving on campus, those tools started to emerge. The human genome was sequenced, and suddenly the ability to read DNA opened the door for us to understand nature in a very different way. Understanding how DNA encodes something, anything, whether that is the scent of a rose, 
or insulin or palm oil. It was like reading instructions. And suddenly we were given the option to maybe take those instructions and have something else make them so that we didn't have to extract them from nature. The implications of this are quite massive. It potentially means moving away from large-scale, energy-intensive, industrial harvesting to microbes, microbial factories, and fermentation to make those same things. These are fermentation vessels. Inside of them are microbes that have been given instruction to make many of these things so that we don't have to extract them from nature. This is biology as technology. This is a new tool. It is growing rather than extracting. So this upcoming pending wave of tools, not on my radar when I was about to graduate, in fact, I was mostly preoccupied with the collapsing economy I was about to graduate into. I had many classmates lose their jobs before they were even able to show up for their first day at work. And despite this gloomy environment, I still believed that the future was limitless. And I think a lot of that had to do with my upbringing. I am the child of immigrants. I experienced the American dream through my parents. And I remember from a young age, my father always telling me to just focus on one simple thing, and that was this, to focus on learning what I loved, because no matter what setback I had in life, that would always belong to me. For me, that was the beauty industry, to which my parents were like, but not, <laughs> not that. <laughs> And it wasn't only them, uh, it was a confusing path, I think, or an unusual one for an MIT grad, in, in, including the beauty industry. The beauty industry, I think, didn't even understand it. I was rejected from every job I applied to. Uh, my foray into the industry started actually with an unpaid internship, uh, and I worked side jobs to make it work, and it was perfect. By the time I was starting my career, it was the rise of the clean beauty movement, and here's where that lens of biology and chemistry came up again, because this movement was focused even more on plants and nature-based stories, and when I thought of nature, I thought of nature as much more than just plants. When I think of nature, I think of the whole tree of life, and actually plants are just a small part of that. Could the tools that we are using be not only unsustainable, but also limiting our creativity? I saw how biotechnology was transforming other industries. I spent a few years working at a biotech company called Ginkgo Bioworks. This is one of their foundries. It is literally an entire room filled with new tools, and tools that you don't see in a cosmetic chemistry lab. Today, I run a company called Archaea. These are some of my colleagues. We call ourselves a biology-first beauty company. We are taking all of these tools and we are pointing them directly at the beauty industry. And what this means is before we weren't able to see or understand these proteins and now we see their three-dimensional structures and that helps us think of them almost as Lego blocks, creating an infinite amount of possibilities to design and put things together. Could we put these blocks together in a way that creates opportunities like hair memory, effectively challenging the basic premise that every time we wash our hair, we have to reintroduce a wave or straightening from the beginning. Biology will transform every single product category. Take sun care into account. Marine life has phenomenal capabilities to protect itself from UV radiation. Fish, after all, do not get sunburned. Could this be an entryway into sun care that we love to use? is also sustainable and not extractive. It could mean better compliance of products and lower rates of skin cancer. The way I see it, biology as technology just opened up the entire tree of life, ethically and sustainably. And it's not just the sustainability profile that has me so excited. It's this ability to tap into sophistication and performance that we haven't been able to so far. But it's also about better safety and better purity of our products as well as new product categories we haven't yet been able to imagine. But there is one thing that hasn't changed, and that is the curious and sometimes judgmental question that I get, which is, why beauty? And for years, I would answer this question by explaining the size and scale of the industry, but after a while, I realized that this question was rooted in something much more complicated. 
Our relationship with beauty is complicated. It is a concept that is hard to understand. Even at Archaea, we struggle with the use of the word beauty. We, of course, love what it represents. It can inspire great joy and creativity and help us feel more like ourselves. But at the same time, we struggle with it because we see whether you are a woman in Iran or a woman in the workplace or any other underrepresented group, there have been tenets of this concept of beauty that have been used to reinforce gender and race inequality at the societal level. But just like when I was graduating, I still believe the future is limitless. I think as an engineer, I understand the transformational power that comes with new tools. Biology is a new tool. What's amazing about biology is it also, it is also inherently individual. At Archaea, we talk about beauty through the lens of expressive biology, something that comes from us rather than being dictated to us. And so I wonder, can biology reframe our relationship with beauty? Could it perhaps even bring beauty back to nature? <laughs>